Let's don the Lightning Reef's power armour and prepare to dispense some brutal and terrifying justice. Today we're talking Night Lords in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking about the 8th Legion in current 40k, an overview of the Night Lords army and how it plays at the moment, and what can be done to make them as terrifying dispensers of justice in Kurz's image. In the video we'll go over all of the Night Lords special rules within the Codex, talk about some of the units and options that might be most relevant to them, and finish up with one strong army list in current 40k. I think arguably at the moment the Night Lords are probably one of the weaker traitor legions from the new Chaos Codex, perhaps a bit more challenging to win with and not quite as strong as say Emperor's Children, Word Bearers or Black Legion, but I think it's still fun to theorise how to get the best out of them and drive them onwards in their course to spread terror in the Imperium. So first up, in the Chaos Codex, all of the legions get a fair amount of support, a legion trait, a unique secondary objective, a whole clutch of stratagems, and then some warlord traits and relic character upgrades. The Night Lord's legion trait is called Terror Tactics, this gives them a minus 2 leadership and minus 1 combat attrition aura within 9 inches, which to be fair really is quite a significant leadership debuff to any of the armies that actually care about morale to a great extent. Unfortunately, as has usually been the case with Night Lords, Leadership shenanigans just don't tend to be all that powerful in 40k, a lot of armies are either immune to morale in the first place, or operate with a lot of single model units like knights for example, and it's only really some armies that are really going to care all that much. A big minus 2 leadership though can really affect some armies, perhaps orcs in particular will really hate this, they already have kind of borderline morale to start with, and they're going to start taking some more serious casualties with this on the go. What actually allows you to convert this negative leadership to damage though, is that if you attack a unit that's less than half strength, or is leadership 5 or less, then when you're in melee combat you also get plus 1 to wound them, which is really quite a nice damage buff. Being less than half strength is only going to happen kind of situationally, it will happen from time to time but you can't really plan around it too hard. Getting down to leadership 5 though is doable for quite a few armies, particularly if you pair knight lords with a unit that causes fear, as we'll talk about in a second. Basically though, units like Raptors for example, will be able to get Leadership 8 things down to Leadership 5, and Leadership 8 is quite a big breakpoint. At that point you're applying it to more of the rank and file models in 40k than you aren't, most loyalist space marines, Eldar, Gene Sealer, Colts, and a fair bit more, and it makes these minus 1 leadership units particularly good for Night Lords. Overall though, as a Legion trade, I think it is a little bit on the subpar side, just because it's very powerful against some armies, but near entirely useless against other really high leadership things, Say for example Custodes or Necrons aren't going to care too much about this. Next, the Night Lord's unique secondary objective is called Sow the Seed, Reap the Fear. This one's No Mercy, No Respite, and it basically gives you victory points for the opponent failing morale or falling back or similar things. You get one victory point every time an enemy unit falls back. That could genuinely be fairly common if you do manage to tag a whole load of things with fast moving things like Warp Talons or Raptors. You get one victory point every time an enemy unit fails an action. That one's a lot less reliable, I wouldn't bank on much from that. One victory point every time an enemy unit fails morale. Hopefully against low leadership armies that might happen at least once or twice per game, maybe more. And finally, whenever you kill an enemy unit, you roll a 2d6, and if it equals or exceeds their leadership, you also gain a victory point. Basically, I think that this one's always going to be kind of niche. In general, I think if you're playing Night Lords, you're likely to be taking a fair few of the units that move fast and have minus one morale, things like Raptors and Possessed. It kind of depends on what the opponent's bringing. If they've got a whole ton of small units that aren't leadership immune, this could be quite good. Armies like Orcs or a Fort Heavy Guard list spring to mind. I don't think they're necessarily guaranteed all that many points though otherwise, and there is some counterplay to your opponent choosing not to fall things back, and maybe instead planning to counter charge. Next up, and perhaps some of the most interesting things to attract you to playing Night Lords are the stratagems, and there are a few fairly good ones. One command point for in Midnight Clad, which gives you a pop-up minus one to hit whenever an infantry unit's being shot. That one's very cheap and effective. It's particularly nice if you're being targeted by anything that's ballistic skill four, and a very nice extra layer of defense on things like Terminators or Possessed. For one CP, there's Sam the Black Hunt. This is a core demon kin or character unit. When they get to fight, they get to reroll hit rolls of one if the enemy is less than starting strength, or is leadership six and below or get to reroll all hit rolls if they're below half strength, or leadership 5 or below. I'd say generally it's usually only going to be worth it if you're triggering the raised part of it, and you're actually getting 4 rerolls to hit. I guess it does depend on the target being meaningful enough to use the stratagem on. 
while also being either leadership 5 or below half strength, perhaps a bit on the niche side, but anything from Terminators, Chosen, Raptors or Walk Talons would all thank you for full hit rerolls. Let's flay them alive for 1 CP, army wide minus 1 combat attrition if you kill the Warlord, I guess if you kill them early and they've got a lot of units that aren't morale immune then that actually could be quite good, still though it's going to be a bit scattergun as to how well you get it to apply. One command point for underhand scheming allows you to fall back and charge. Always handy for assault units. If you've got raptors or warp talons tangling with something that's a bit too tough to take down, jumping out and bullying and exposed targets could always be a nice option. Next up for one or two CP, there's from the night. This one's an infantry or biker unit coming from reserves, and they get to come in one round earlier. It's two CP if it's demon kin or one command point otherwise. I guess in theory this one is an interesting one for a turn one alpha strike. Maybe it could be kind of interesting on a really big blob of Terminators to get them some really good positioning turn 1, and maybe deliver some punishment with some combi weapons to boot. I think perhaps one of the most annoying things though is that there isn't really a decent way of guaranteeing that they make a charge after they came in. If they did then this could be really interesting. Otherwise I guess you could reliably get it to deliver a shooting unit, but if you're actually wanting to make a charge you're still going to be a bit on the risky side. Next up for 1 CP we have Screaming Skies. This allows a jump back unit to go back into reserve. It does so at the start of your movement phase and they come back in your next turn. Perhaps useful for a couple of reasons this one. You could maybe think about it late game to jump a unit that's out of position and maybe come down to do a secondary objective or harass an enemy unit on a backfield objective. And it also could be a quite nice alternative to that underhand scheming one. If a jump unit's locked up with something that they don't really want to be fighting anymore, you either have the option of falling back and charging or jumping them back up into the sky. Next up for 2CP we've got We Have Come For You. You use this on a core demon kin or character unit when they're in combat and it basically means that the enemy can't fall back unless they're a vehicle, titanic or aircraft. Kind of interesting that monster isn't included on there so it means that you could potentially lock some big critters in combat. I think that this stratagem is really quite powerful to be honest, particularly against a shooting army this could be really painful. Aim to kill a unit on the charge with your unit, consolidate into something else and then next turn when they'd ideally want to fall back and the rest of their army shoot your unit, then just casually prevent them falling back for 2 CP, and hopefully cut up that locked up enemy unit in their own fight phase, and move on to new targets in your turn. I do quite like this one, could be absolutely game changing in the right circumstance. If the enemy doesn't have a good way to counter charge you and clear you in melee, then it basically means that your squad is safe for a turn. Finally for 2 CP we have Vox Scream, you use it at the end of your movement phase and then you select one enemy unit within 12 inches of a Night Lord's unit from your army. Until the start of your next movement phase, it can't use any of its aura abilities and you can only use the stratagem once per game. This one does cost a bit, but it can be quite nice for putting a spanner in the opponent's works. I guess the ideal target for this will be something like Gilliman, something with an aura so powerful that it's potentially quite game changing, though it could be a big deal on plenty of other souped up characters as well. Say for example a Space Marine Apothecary with a Feel No Pain that's also been upgraded to give that aura of obsec. Take all that away for an important turn and you could gain a decent advantage and take an objective. Perhaps not one to use literally every single game, but given the right target could be well worth it and even could be worth moving up a unit specifically to use that stratagem. Moving on we've got the Warlord Traits and Relics. For the Warlord Traits we start off with Night Haunter's Curse. Once per turn you can change a hit, wound, advance or save to a single unmodified 6. Sorry I didn't write hit rolls on that list, but you certainly can use it for that. It's quite nice that you can both use this in your turn and also in your opponent's turn as well. So it basically means that you could plug in some extra damage in your turn and pretty well guarantee a save in your opponent's turn. And what's great is that you can change it after the dice has been rolled, essentially pretty much negating a failed save each turn. I think this one's actually deceptively powerful can be a very solid buff both to damage and defence in the right circumstances. Next up we've got one piece at a time. This one triggers when you've killed some of an enemy unit but not wiped it out. The enemy unit gets minus one combat attrition and the warlord can then consolidate in any direction even leaving combat. So basically it means that you could hit an enemy squad and then not remain in combat for them to strike you back. I think the combat attrition thing is super situational though being able to hit an enemy unit and then leave combat really is quite powerful. It can open up some pretty big shenanigans and get you some good positioning, though I guess you would need a warlord that is going to be somewhat likely to survive the enemy counterattack. Next up we've got Murderous Reputation, a 6 inch aura of cancelling obsec, pretty nice in combination with your own obsec, as if your warlord has this it basically guarantees that you have the objective 
until the enemy kills either your obsec model or this guy. Certainly seems like a nice to have on a model that's moving up the board. Next up there's Killing Fury. Melee attacks count as in wanton slaughter for the first round of combat for this warlord and you get an extra d3 attacks as well. So basically exploding sixes and an average of two extra attacks each turn. It's not too bad though I'm not sure it really outcompetes things like Flames of Spite from the generic Chaos Marine warlord table. Perhaps could be an interesting one with something like a demon prince with that Golax relic. Next up there's one with the shadows, minus one to hit the warlord and the opponent can't b-roll hit rolls against them. It's an okay durability buff for something like a Lord Discordant or a Demon Prince, I suppose, but overall I'm not super convinced that this one is great. And finally we've got Dirty Fighter, one enemy unit within 3 inches must fight last, a really quite nice rule to have on melee characters pushing up the board. I feel like this one's going to be quite a common pick as it prevents your opponent from interrupting with the unit, therefore allowing you to safely charge two different units on different parts of the board without having to worry about either of them suddenly getting the jump on you and killing you before you get to strike. Finally we get to the relics, and I feel like perhaps the relics might be one of the weaker sections of the Night Lord's Codex. Most of these just feel a little bit tame compared with the generic picks that you can take. First up, and I think one of the best, is the Claw of the Stygian Count. This one replaces either a Lightning Claw, Malefic Talon, or a Cursed Weapon. The profile strength plus 2, AP minus 3, and damage 2, plus 2 attacks, and you can't use any Ignore Wounds rolls against this, so it'll be quite good at chewing through things that take a maximum of a certain amount of wounds. Things like Catan Shards or Feel No Pain type saves. I think you could pretty reasonably justify this on just about any of the intended targets. A Chaos Lord with a Lightning Claw gets a general purpose weapon. The plus two attacks really is very nice. It's a very solid upgrade for an Accursed weapon. And it seems very scary on a Demon Prince's Malefic Talon as well. That'd be eight attacks, strength nine and damage two. Plus the ability to ignore the wounds. I'd say that might be my favourite out of them. Otherwise we've got the Vox Demonicus. This one prevents enemy models coming in within 12 inches from reserve, and there's a chance to prevent them from doing actions within 12 inches too. I guess that's not terrible to try and park on a midfield objective. It could annoy the opponent trying to take it. The Talent of the Night Terror, our fly unit one for Demon Prince, I guess, moving over a unit to deal D3 mortal wounds on a 2+, and they also get an extra D3 mortal wounds on the charge as well, again on the roll of a 2+. It's not dreadful, but I feel like you're going to be better off actually buffing the Demon Prince's melee, as they do have a massive stat line that's going to get a lot out of any relics. The Scourging Chains get you an extra AP minus 1 in melee, and enemy models in engagement range get minus 1 attack, an okay mix of buff and debuff, though nothing too exciting I think. The Misery of the Meek is a once per game ability to heal 3 wounds, get plus D3 attacks, and get an extra 3 inch aura. An okay one time boost, but the three wounds thing generally means that you need to have taken damage but not be killed, and that's not always guaranteed. The storm bolt plate means that you can't shoot the bearer unless they're within 12 inches or the closest, and they also count as being both in light and heavy cover. This one's infantry only, so sadly you can't put it on something like a Lord Discordant, but if you had a Terminator character that is a decent durability boost, getting the plus one to saves from cover really is very nice on a two plus armor save with armor of contempt. It means that you're saving AP minus 3 on 3s, so it's likely to keep him safe from all but the very heaviest fire and melee damage. Finally, we've got a relic called Flayer, a sword or cursed weapon upgrade, strength plus 2, AP 3 and damage 2, and slain models count as 2 for the purposes of morale. Kind of doubling down on leadership shenanigans there. The weapon's okay, but not particularly outstanding, I think. I feel like Night Lords are already kind of ahead with the leadership game, and I'm not really sure how much over-investing in that is when it's still not going to be too relevant against plenty of armies. So taking a quick summary of all these rules, which are perhaps the most interesting things that you might actually want in your army, or to build around. First up, for stronger units for the Night Lords, I feel that basically anything with minus one leadership is going to be a really interesting pick. There's quite a few options throughout the Chaos Codex. Raptors get it innately, plus are very fluffy indeed for the Night Lords. The new bigger Chaos Possessed get it, and with their low strength weapons, plus one to wound is very nice. The Demon Prince also gets a minus one leadership aura, as do the Chaos Spawn. Getting up to the plus one to wound in combat is going to be great on just about anything. But I think it's perhaps particularly good on anything with mid to low strength. Raptors are strength four, Possessed and Spawn are both strength five, so getting plus one to wound on those is going to make them very viable against most targets. Generally, the Night Lords are also very encouraged to go for melee units over range. Their main buff is for melee combat with a plus one to wound, plus having a lot of fast moving units to jump out and push up the board will put a lot more units in minus two leadership range. 
Plus, most of their stratagems also want to be in close to use them as well, preventing fall back or falling back and charging yourself. I do quite like the way that they've made it particularly tempting to take things like raptors and warp talons as well. They're fast-moving infantry units that fit the above criteria. You can use the minus one to hit stratagem on them, and you can jump them on and off the board towards the end of the game, if that makes more sense. After the character upgrades, I feel like the most useful relics are maybe that Claw of the Stygian Count, general purpose and dangerous on a Demon Prince, Lord or Terminator champion, and I do quite like the Stormbolt plate if you happen to be running a Terminator character anyway. I think the Warlord traits are more interesting on the whole though. Dirty Fighter for fights last on something like a Demon Prince or a Lord Discordant I think is rarely going to be a bad choice. Murderous Reputation to cancel Obsec paired with your own Obsec troops means that the objective will be yours. And I do think that Night Haunter's Curse is quite a nice character buff. Feeding in automatic sixes each turn means that you actually get some pretty decent damage and defence, perhaps more useful for saves than anything else. Finally, stratagems wise, I think that the biggest plays are things like Vox Scream for 2 CP to turn off the auras, 2 command points to prevent falling back, and I feel like that minus 1 to hit infantry 1 is often going to be quite tempting to use, depending on what exactly is shooting it and how much they care. Finally, I thought we'd just finish up with one competitive Night Lords list, and from searching tournament results, I think that this one by Colin K is one of the best placing Night Lords lists since the Chaos Codex dropped, though admittedly it hasn't been out long at this point. This Night Lord list came third at the Warhound Game and Grid GT, and runs quite a few options that feel very Night Lords indeed. First up, we've got a Demon Prince with Wings, with a Hellforge Sword and Mark of Nurgle. He's also got Infernal Gaze, though he could just give out the minus one to hit from the Nurgle power, and he takes that Golax the Decayed Relic, the Nurgle Demon Weapon that automatically wounds, and also ignores enemy, ignores wounds abilities. A very common and very scary Demon Prince build, got a great chance of cutting through some of the very fattiest things in the game, and I think he was also the Warlord as well, though I couldn't see the Warlord trait recorders. Even something like the extra attacks from that Night Lord's one though could actually be relevant. Next up is a trusty Lord Discordant with Bale Flamer and Technovirus Injector. This one takes the mark of Slanesh. And it's a really intimidating prospect to face down in combat as it has Dirty Fighter to make the enemy fight last. So often this will be fighting before your opponents. And also takes the Intoxicating Elixir from Slanesh. This is the one that can prevent him losing any more than 3 wounds in a single fight phase. Basically meaning that if your opponent charges him and tries to kill him, he's basically completely invulnerable for a turn, and will guarantee himself being able to swing back. Next up, there's a Master of Possession with Mutated Invigoration and Pact of Flesh. This one looks like it's too buff the Terminators with the Black Rune of Damnation. Toughness 5 Terminators with minus 1 to wound and regeneration. They're not going to be models that are going anywhere fast. Finally, in the Elite slot, there's a Master of Executions with the Mark of Slanesh. Just in general, a really efficient character, getting those mortal wounds on sixes. And that's really quite an interesting combo that this guy's used here. He's taken the Night Haunter's Curse, so that one that allows you to turn dice rolls into six. And also has taken the Warp's Malice, the Relic Bolt Pistol, with extra damage. The Bolt Pistol causes two mortal wounds and the attack sequence to end on a hit roll of a six. So you could feed in that Night Haunter's Curse roll into that, and basically guarantee two mortal wounds out of him at every shooting phase, as well as a fair bit more damage. If not used there though, he could also use it in melee. Again, hit rolls of 6 give him 2 mortal wounds as well. Quite a fun little build, and the Marco Slanesh will allow him to fight first as well. Quite a nice combo with the big heroic intervention. Then moving on to squads, and it's all legionaries in the troop slots. 2 units of 5, one of which takes a Marco Slanesh and a Balefire Tome. That one would allow them to give a big squad of 5 plus feel no pain. Could be the Terminators if it was wanted. There's then a big and threatening unit of 10 legionaries. They're set out as a very fighty squad with the Mark of Corn and the Icon, and take a Chain Axe and a Power Fist as well. Maybe not quite as ridiculously hard to shift as the Terminators, but still okay with a bunch of bodies with Armour of Contempt. The standard guys all be Strength 5 and AP-2, and the Chain Axe and Power Fist even better. There's then the big unit of Terminators that seems to be near or to include in most Chaos lists these days. Six Power Fists and two Chain Fists, Mark of Slanesh for fighting first and being able to be targeted with the Psychic Power and the Black Rune of Damnation to make them minus one to wounds. Pretty excellent in combination with that Master of Possession. Then a few other small squads, a unit of six Raptors that could bully enemy infantry, but six of them is quite good for jumping around the board doing retrieve Nephilim data, a unit of five Warp Talons, which are just generally quite a nice distraction and disruption unit in Night Lords in general, they work with most of their stratagems and things that they want to do, and then a unit of five Havocs, two Lascans and two Missile Launchers, a Marco Slanesh and a Flamer. 
Marco Slanesh could be quite interesting on them as they have that one command point, one to make a damage result in auto six. Really quite powerful for punching through enemy tanks hard. Last but not least, there's a single demon engine in a venom crawler. Generally, their stat lines all around okay, but they help out any psychic casts going around as well, giving you plus one to cast powers on that master of possession. Overall, it's very cool to see a decent performance with Night Lords. I still feel that out of the Chaos Legions, they're probably not the easiest army to win with, so hats off for a good performance. So anyway, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. How are the Sons of Curse faring for you in the new Chaos Codex? If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, but I'll certainly hope to keep the 40k videos coming. I'll hope to be making a similar video review for each one of the Chaos Legions in turn. Let me know what you'd most like to see next down in the comments. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, which you can find down in the video description. The Patreon page is how I can afford to spend the time making all the 40k videos like this, so if you are enjoying a lot, any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.